story. With the Paul Pierce story. Wow, this is what it looks like from this angle. This is very cool. <laughs> now you know what it's like. Yeah. Uh, Paul Pierce story. Um, Paul and I had this little secret. Paul came up to me and he said, would you mind doing something for me? And I said, no, of course not. He said, before every game, would you tell me the names of the officials so that I can communicate with them? And I said, sure. So Paul would come out in every game and he'd come up and he'd give me a hug. And I would say something like, Joe, Marat, and Sam. Sam's the white guy. Okay? And Paul would go like, okay, fine. I got him. And then I'd watch Paul and he would go over and go, Sam, how you doing? Good to see you tonight. Joe, how you doing? So that was my link with Paul and getting him set for the officials for the, every game. So that... That started that whole thing where I used to bang fists with the players because they looked and they saw Paul would come over and give me a hug and Rondo was the first one to try to figure out what was going on so he started coming over and giving me a tap on the shoulder. Even Garnett got into it for a while. He used to prefer to blow dust at me than actually do anything else. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's my best Paul Pierce story. Paul, I, I'm very partial to Paul because when I did the Celtics early on when Larry Bird and all those guys were around, I just did the home games. And then when they went on the road, I went and did the Big East. And you guys know, you get to know players on the road, you don't get to know players at home. Because they, they're looking to get out of the locker room, you're looking to get your, your deadlines met. Um, and it's on the buses, it's on the, on the planes, it's shoveling out your car at Hanscom Air Force Base at 2 o'clock in the morning. That's when you really get to know guys. So I never got to know the, the Bird crew all that well. I would... Uh, I would literally go to the press room in the old garden, sit down with Tommy and Johnny Most. We would have dinner, then we'd go down to Red's office, and Red would tell us what was going to happen in the game for about 20 minutes. You'd just sit there silently and listen. And then I'd go to the overhang and the techniques banner in the old garden, do the game, go back to my car and go home. So I'd never have anything to do with the players. So that whole era, everybody says, well, gee, I would think Larry would be the guy you're close to, or Kevin would be the guy you're close to. That was not the case. Uh, but the case was, from the time Paul showed up until the time he left, I was around. And I was with him in parking lots, I was with him in planes and trains and buses. And um, So he's a special kid to me. So when you say Paul Pierce, when you hear the name Paul Pierce, what goes through your mind, Mike, as a human being and as a, as a, as a basketball player? Well, as a basketball player, I agree with Tommy. You know, this is heresy to some people. Tommy says if he had eight seconds or seven, seven seconds left in a game and he had the ball and he could put it in one guy's hands who's ever been a Celtic, he'd put it in Paul Pierce's hands. So uh, that, that's coming from a pretty good source. Um, I, I just think of Paul as a winner. Uh, I think of him as a guy. Uh, I'll tell you another Paul story. He won't, I won't say he won't like this one. He'll be embarrassed by this one. When he got named captain of the team, we, we used to fly an old McDonnell Douglas airplane where you boarded from the rear of the aircraft and walked forward. The press was always in the rear, so we'd get in and take our seats, and then all the players would go by us. So Paul walks by us the day he's been named captain. He's got these two Barnes & Noble bags in his hands, okay? Now, you don't see a lot of Barnes & Noble bags on, on, on the charter. Um, so I'm thinking, what's going on here? So we're, we're flying the old Miami Heat plane that had a compartment up in the front. And it was an all-night flight back from Sacramento, I think. So I'm wandering around the aisles, and I get up to the little compartment, and I look in, and there's Paul sitting there, and he's got about eight books on leadership spread out on a table. And he's just, he's kind of staring at him, Like, you know, I think Judge Apto had a session, and he said, I didn't know you had to read them. I thought you just had to buy them, you know? Um, and I think that's what Paul was hoping, that uh, maybe if he stared at him long enough, some of the leadership <laughs> things would come back to him. But the mere fact that once he got named captain, he went and bought a bunch of books on leadership tells you a lot about who he is. Did that season when they had the anti-game losing streak, did, that any, did you, anything reveal about his character during that season and obviously it turned around? Like, yeah, I, you know, the, the thing during that losing streak was it's hard to imagine that that was the year before they won the championship. And, um, you know, that's how close they were. You know, they, uh, it, it's kind of like this team right now, this, this team that we have now that won 17 games was not a 17 and 0 team. They weren't coming in and blowing everybody out. They were coming in and winning, coming, be, coming from behind a lot, as we all know. Uh, so that other team was very similar. Even though they were losing with the final score all the time, they were competitive. And you knew they were just not even so much a player away, they were just some experience together away. And uh, once they got their act together, they were pretty tough to stop.